Dear listeners, thank you for joining us on Cutting Edge, a show podcasted by the London-based Global Podcasting Network. Today on our show, we travel to Muscat, Oman to meet with DIY multi-talented musician and singer, songwriter, Ali Hugo. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for coming down to Hugo Production Studios. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So first off, for the listeners who have never heard of Ali Hugo before, how would you sum yourself up in a few words? Well, Ali Hugo is a multi-instrumentalist, singer-songwriter, sound engineer, mastering agent, performer, and that's basically how I would sum myself up in my art. Okay, and what is the new generation Farhan and what kind of audience would it appeal to? New Generation Farhan is an album that um, I give tribute to my um, great grandfather. His name is Farhan and um, I come from a very musical family. So uh, some of us are musicians, others are artists, painters. And in Stonetown, Zanzibar, where my grandfather was born, at the Palace Museum, there is actually a painting a painting of the Sultan of Oman, and inscribed at the bottom of that painting says, uh, this painting is by Abdallah Farhan. So part of that album gives tribute to him, it also gives tribute to the new generation that's being born. And so the song Enzo on the album is dedicated to my nephew who was born in Paris. So the album does have kind of like a European or especially specifically a, a French feel to it all around. Uh, some people like to call it elevator music. Some people like to call it studying music, you know, background music. I prefer to see it as uh, healing music, the kind of music that you listen to, you know, when you have a hard day at work or, uh, you know, you just come back from seeing your shrink. That's the kind of music that you play that takes you to a healing journey. Okay, you've touched on it slightly there, but aside from your family, what has been the main inspiration behind this particular release? Well, the main inspiration is the fact that I was disgruntled by what was on the radio for so many years. I, I would turn on the radio and and I, I just didn't like any of the stu- the new stuff that was coming out. And I thought to myself, well, look, if you're not if you're not happy with what's out there, why don't you just make your own music? And so I started off with me just writing recording music on my eight track at home and laying down some tracks and then before I knew it I said okay now I have enough material maybe I should go in the studio and lay down some real tracks and then I was designing album covers and then I was designing promotional strategies and and before I knew we had new generation fair hat. Okay you've been creating music for several years now how do you feel you have evolved both as a musician and as a person? As a musician I've evolved I've become a better performer, a better technician, uh, a better instrumentalist, the way I play my music. You know, I I started singing when I was eight years old. And I remember when I, in Toronto, when I first gone into a major recording studio, when I was eight, I was performing other people's songs. So I was pretty much an impersonator. And here I am in Toronto at Metal's metalwork recording studio and they charge about five hundred dollars an hour you know and i 
I'm trying to record my songs, but I'm asking myself, who do you sound like? Who are you gonna, how are you going to project yourself? Because you've been singing other people's songs for too long. How, what does Ali Hugo sound like? So now I can, I'm confident in uh, how I project myself, the kind of art that I can project myself with. Uh, my, I know my strengths and my limitations. Th that's in terms of musically and as, as a performer. As a person, I think I've obviously I've, I'm, I'm not in my teens anymore. Um, I've gone through different experiences in life and um, some of those experiences contributed to New Generation's Farahan, some of the tracks. But ironically, some of the tracks, I wrote the music and then I, I experienced, you know, the actual relevancy, a life relevancy to that music. So I have a, a number four record on the EthnoCloud um, North American charts right now, Tears of a Broken Heart. And uh, certainly when I was writing that music, at that point, I didn't know that the, a year or two after writing that and recording it, I would actually experience tears of a broken heart. So I've, I've definitely changed as a person. I've, I've matured. Okay. Hopefully I've become a better person. And you did take some time out. Um, why was this and how did you pass that time? What were you doing while you weren't in the limelight? Well, after being in North America, and uh, knocking on every door possibly to get my record, uh, to get a record deal. You know, and I, I remember when I, when I got my first rejection letter at that point, I thought to myself, why am I being rejected? I mean, I have the talent, I have the know-how, I can do this. Why are these people rejecting me? And so I came to understand that, you know, the record industry had been politicized. And when you politicize something, the dynamics change. And I wasn't really uh, suited for that kind of an environment. And I thought to myself, look, everybody told me that if you come to North America, you're never going to make it, you're going to work at McDonald's. And maybe this is true. And so maybe I should focus on another direction and something that I, I also love other than music, which is academia. And so I said to myself, no more music. I'm just going to go back to school. I'm going to get my degree, get my master's and get my PhD and then just forget about music. If I have to sing, I'll sing in, I'll sing in my room just before I go to bed. Right. And how did you decide when the right time was to put all your energy back into the music and, and stop doing all these other things? Well, it, 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 it occurred to me that after, after that long time out, that when you're an artist, you can't really stop creating art. You can um, fool yourself to saying that I'm never going to do this. And this is exactly what I did. But essentially, uh, the, the creative process is happening whether you want it to happen or not. You know, so you're constantly being inspired. You're constantly saying things that are amounting to lyrics, that are amounting to maybe song titles. Um, and, and now I'm at that stage in my life where I realize that, uh, you, you know, if you're an artist, in order to live, you have to create art. So if you're a painter and you, you, you can't afford uh, the most expensive acrylics, then you know, you're gonna have to um, paint with coal or I don't know, find some kind of crayons or mm -hmm. something like that. But uh, as an artist, it's, it's becoming very clear to me right now that I can't just say that I'm gonna stop making art and, and just, it, it's impossible. I tried it for 10 years and here I am, I'm back, back in the studios and recording music again. And you are known for your DIY approach to making and promoting your music. Yes. So can you tell us what are the key elements of this approach? The DIY approach, and uh, it's important for me to point out that when I was doing New Generation Farhan, uh, the thing that really inspired me was the fact that I wanted to um, get the message out to a lot of young people, or maybe people who are not so young, but there are indie artists, that you don't need to sell your soul in order to make good music and be successful. We're lucky that we live in a time right now where you can actually take a DIY approach to music. You can record your music, you can master your music, you can promote your music, you can distribute your music. The DIY approach to music essentially is about understanding that it's not enough for you just to have talent. You have to study, you have to study technically, how to create your music, you have to study how to promote your music, 
And then you have to study and know, you know, how to reach out to your audience. And that's, but nobody can do it better than you can. You know, I'm not saying that it, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm never going to sign to a major label record company I'm, and I'm not discouraging other people to, but I'm just saying that if you're not there and if you don't have the opportunities, there's still ways that you can do it, but you can't sit around and wait for, you know, stars to fall from heaven. You know, you need to get up and uh, get the ball rolling. And when you take the DIY approach, is it still easy for you to connect with uh, your listeners, the people listening to your music and, and the people supporting you? How do you stay in contact with them? Well, I, I'm, I've been very lucky to be able to use a lot of um, social media and I have a, I'm lucky to have the supporting teams that I have right now. I have a team here in Oman and I have a team in, in, uh, in, in Canada that's, um, I call them the NGF team, that, that are really uh, devoting a lot of their time to, to making my music reach my fans, but also social media, I mean, Facebook and, and um, my distributors, uh, whether it's uh, CD Baby or Nimbit Music, whom I've partnered with, YouTube, uh, and how I distribute my videos, my fans reach out to that. But I hope my fans understand that when you take a DIY approach, you're sometimes overwhelmed with uh, the amount of work that you have to, you know, to bear and to undertake. And it's not always possible for you to uh, respond to every letter or every email or every uh, Facebook comment. Uh, I, I try to reach out and, 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 and you know, respond to all these different messages that I get and all these different reach outs that I get from my fans, but it's not always possible, but I do want them to know that it's, I, I appreciate them and uh, I appreciate them reaching out and following me on Twitter, on Facebook and yeah. Okay. So in this DIY approach, you are doing almost everything in terms of your music. Yes. What is your favorite part of the entire process behind making one song? And why? It used to be um, the marketing and, uh, you know, designing the album covers and uh, marketing uh, the music uh, in different regions of the world. Now, though, I, I'm really intrigued and it, uh, the, the process of sound engineering is very intricate. And um, I mean, I, I, I grew up listening to records that were engineered by people like Umberto Gartica. And people like, at that time, I really didn't understand what really went into that uh, when you have instruments that have been laid down on 30 tracks, you know, and then mixing them and then having them played seamlessly as a cohesive package. Is, is, uh, it takes a lot of creative input to get that going. And so um, now that I'm doing that on my own, not only am I studying from virtuosos and, you know, geniuses like Umberto Gartica, but um, that's the, the, the most interesting aspect of um, music making for me right now is the mastering process, the mixing process, and then the engineering the sound and making it sound exactly how I want, how my vision uh, perceives it, and then how I want my audience to hear it. Okay. Yeah. And what do you have in store for the future? Do you see yourself going in a different direction musically, or will it be more of the same? Well, it'll definitely be um, a different direction because I, obviously I'm going to be, uh, you know, if I go back to the studio, we're, we're about to wrap up uh, New Generation Farhan. I think we have one more single to release, uh, Moonlight Lullaby, and the video is coming up, coming out pretty soon. And then after that, um, I'm going to take time out again and go back to the studio with a, a friend of mine who owns a studio in Toronto, Bryant, and he owns B Music Studio. And uh, we're going to try to uh, digitize and remaster a lot of the um, old uh, tracks that I did when I was in my teens. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, the record company Hugo Productions is going to release those to the public, but they're definitely going into the Ali Hugo vault. So that's probably going to take a, another two years before I go back into the studio again. If I'm going to record another album, obviously the concept is going to be very different. Um, and Every musician has a, a, a hometown or a place 
that they feel if I've made it there, then I don't care if I made it anywhere else in the world, but if I've made it there, then I've made it, you know? And for me, Montreal is that place being a, a pro Francophone Canadian. I, I can only see myself hopefully making a French album. I don't know if I'm going to write lyrics or uh, even do vocals in the future, but um, yeah, so maybe an album that's uh, more uh, Quebec inspired in the future. Okay, and lastly, before we finish up, for the listeners who want to access your music and your new album, where can they find your where can they find your songs? I've been really lucky that um, the album charted at, entered the top 10 on the indie charts. And then um, my latest single, Tears of a Broken Heart, is at number four on the um, US North American charts, Ethno Cloud charts. The video, which I produced as well, along with Ian Watt and um, Alex Fox and a couple of other people, is uh, accessible on YouTube. So. All of that gave me a lot of streaming opportunities. So now my music can be found on uh, major outlets like iTunes, um, TuneCore, Nimbit Music, CD Baby, YouTube. And um, I can't think of any other outlet that's out there that doesn't have New Generation for our hand or, or at least the singles from that, uh, from the album. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you for coming down to uh, Huga Production Studios. Again, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Before signing off, we would like to thank Hugo for having us here at Hugo Production Studio. We'd also like to thank our listeners and our sponsors, the Global Podcasting Network from Muscat Oman. I'm Sabra Abukhalid. This is saying goodbye for now. Oh.